Hey everybody, I'm John. If you came in late or I haven't met you before, um, I'm one of the pastors here. And actually this week, let me tell you a secret, I'm the only pastor here this week. Um, uh, that's, Greensburg actually applauded for that. I was, uh, yeah, but it's on camera. I get it. You guys don't want them watching this afterwards. So I get that. So um, it is great to be with you this morning. And uh, I don't know about you, but you know, when I look back on these last couple years, right, 2020 and 2021, it, it kind of feels like those tier, two years are, are a little bit more like two lifetimes to me. Um, you know, like early 2020, everything started out pretty normal. And then very, very quickly, this is what 2020 turned into, the dumpster fire, right? It's a dumpster fire we all remember as 2020. And I don't know about you, I remember really clearly the first week or two of March, where we kind of went from this, uh uh-oh, should I be concerned about this, to, oh my gosh, what is going on? And suddenly we went from getting together for church, we went from going to school and going to work and gathering together with our friends and our family, we went to that to just lock down at home, you know, and you're like, maybe I'll just sit here and watch the rest of the world burn from here. It was, it was a really weird and surreal time for all of us. And just like all of your households and each of you, my family, my house, we dealt with that um, differently. Um, And uh, sometimes crisis like that, it brings out your strengths and sometimes it, it brings out your weaknesses. And so For our family, if any of you know my wife, Melissa, and she's here today, so I'm not talking about her behind her back. I did that in Greensburg. Here, here, she's here. Um, If you've met my wife, Melissa, she is the quintessential homeschool mom, right? And she's got this little bit of doomsday prepper in her. So when the pandemic hit, like, she didn't stop. It's, she was prepared for this, right? She had her checklist out, and she's like, oh, I got food, check. We got supplies, check. Is everybody in the house and doors are locked, check. Let's bring up the drawbridge. Nobody's getting on the property. There's no microbes coming on. We're safe and secure for now, but let's remain vigilant, right? That was totally how she reacted because she'd been preparing and ready for that moment her entire life. So she was there. But if there was any one weakness with her plan, it was me. It was, it was definitely me. Because here's the thing, if you don't know this about me already, I tend to think I'm kind of uh, indestructible. I don't like to follow rules. And I can be very forgetful or dumb. One of those two, depends on who you ask. But <laughs> if there was any breach, as time went on, if there was any breach in our security perimeter, that was clearly me. I mean, sure, I I stayed at home most of the first two weeks, and I came into church just to make sure we could record our services for those Sundays, and I made sure our bills got paid as a church, but I was clearly the problem. And so as time went on, the tension began to rise in our house, because I thought Melissa was being way too over the top and way too strict, and she thought I was being way too cavalier and way too reckless when it came to the pandemic. And so we just didn't see eye to eye. And I don't know how your household handled it. I'm sure some of you felt the same thing, but man, it was a tough, difficult time for us. And it seemed like every week we were having the exact same argument again. And we knew it wasn't good for our marriage. We knew it wasn't good for our family, but we just felt stuck, right? We were angry we were hurt. We didn't know how to move forward. And so when I think of that time and what was going through my head, and actually it may be still true now, here's kind of the reason why I think. Here it is. She thought, saw things her way and I saw things the right way. <laughs> right? Let's be honest. She saw things her way and I saw things the right way. Sure, she's got an undergrad degree in biology. Sure she does. And she watched the news a lot more than I did, but I couldn't understand why we couldn't just get past this. You know, I just kept thinking, if you would only see things my way, then we would be on our way. If you would only see things my way, we would be on our way. And my guess is that for all of us, at some time in our lives, we've kind of thought the same thing, right? With with any relationship that you have in your life that's been broken or strained or maybe just a super awkward relationship, could be current, could be in the past, friend or a family member or coworker, neighbor, whoever it is, right? I'm sure we've all thought something similar. And here's what we think. We think if they would just see things my way, 
everything would be okay, right? Right? We've thought that. Let's be honest. How many, how many of us have thought that? Thank you. You guys are very brave. We'll pray for you later. But yeah, <laughs> all of us have thought that. So we've decided as a church to come alongside you in this quest. We do. We, we want to help you answer the question that you've been asking yourself your whole life. And here's the question. What's wrong with these people? <laughs> right? What's wrong with these people? And some of you are thinking, finally, something in church I can relate to. I might actually listen today. What's wrong with these people? And so what we've done is we've come up with this four-week series. I, I think you're really going to like it. And the title of the series is this, How to Get People to See Things Your Way. How to See Things Your Way. Because it's the right way, right? Your way is the right way. And here's what we know. Until they say, see things our way, well, they're just holding us up, right? They're holding us up from being all hunky-dory, right? They're holding us up from having another Christmas with an awkward dinner, Another family get together that's uncomfortable. We want to equip you with the necessary skills so you're not having the umpteenth conversation with your kids about why hanging out with the right friends matter. We want to help you with that father-in-law and the mother-in-law issue. You know the one where they're constantly judging you, constantly evaluating you. You don't want that anymore. That family member who's constantly bringing up politics or a social issue during dinner, when are they going to learn to just knock it off so we don't mind spending time with them, right? So here's, here's what we've done. Dan and I are so excited about this. We got together, and we put together this four-week series on how to approach relationships. And here's what it's called, the C4 approach to relationship management. Now, this is going to be super relevant, super current. I really think it's going to be helpful for you. By the way, pure coincidence that C4 is also an explosive. <laughs> that's, that's totally unrelated. Just, just ignore that part. But let me tell you, here's the four principles that we're going to cover during these four weeks together. Convince, convict, coerce, and control. Come on, same with me now, same with me. Convince, convict, coerce, and control. That's really good. We're, we're going to teach you over the next four weeks how to master these. We want you to master these so people can start to see things your way finally. And I hear some of you laughing a little bit. I, I, I know you're skeptical, right? I hear a little skepticism. I want to remind you that these are the tools that brought our nation together these last two years, right? They have. They have, but I realize there's some skepticism here, so we thought, we'd, uh, we thought we'd run a video with some people who have gone through this before, and you can see what they've learned. Here, give this a watch. The C4 approach to relationship management has completely turned our marriage oh, around. Absolutely. <laughs> so close to just failing, you know? <laughs> All four Cs are complete game changers. Convince coerce, convict, and control. <laughs> if there was a fifth C, it'd be cool. <laughs> Six months ago, I was gonna take a week and a half off from my wedding and honeymoon. The day before I headed out to the resort, Lisa told me that she needed a pitch deck done in a day and a half. And what did I say? You said, looks like you'll need to postpone that wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm single now. My relationship with my son has always been very interesting. He loves acting, but I love football. He's my son, he lives in my house, so he should be playing my favorite sport. The C4 approach to relationship understands that and helps me call all the right plays. I can't wait to try my costume. Uniform. And then go to my audition. Tryouts. Hey, what do you do when you score? You bow. Spike it, son. <laughs> you spike it. Check out the C4 approach to relationships ASAP. You'll learn things like how to shame journal. I started a shame journal myself, and it's just a detailed list of every time that Emily has hurt me or let me down. And now, when we have an argument, I just read her a few entries, and before you know it, she sees things my way. I've been journaling since eighth grade. See, you didn't know the answer to your problems was starting a shame journal, did you? That's, <clears throat> that's a brilliant thing. So, yeah, so this C4 uh, Guide to Relationship Management, again, let's put the four C's up here. Convince, convict, coerce, and control. This is what we're going to cover over the next four weeks. 
And uh, before we start covering it, though, I need to give you a little bit word of warning, all right? So listen carefully. Don't share this with anybody else. Don't share this with anyone outside of the room because I, I know this is going to seem a little crazy, but they think you're the problem. They do. They think you're the problem. So if they learn about these tools, they might be able to use them to help convince and convict you to see it their way. They might be able to get, co get you to coerce to come their way, and we don't want that, right? And by the way, don't we all respond really well to these, right? Don't we love it when people use these four tools on us? How many love to be controlled and coerced? Nobody does. No, nobody does. Let's be honest. Nobody does, right? Some of you are going to be disappointed because you thought that was all real, but no, that was just a sham. That none of us, none of us like to be convinced, convicted, coerced, or controlled, do we? No, we hate that when people use that on us, but these are the tools that we reach for so often when we have a broken relationship in our life, right? When we have a strained relationship or something goes wrong and we're trying to fix it, these are the tools that we tend to reach for first. And when we do and things go sideways, we think to ourselves, ah, I gave it my best. You know, I tried. I, I don't know where to go from here. See, here's the thing. Relationships, restoring relationships, rebuilding relationships is really, really hard. And so that's why we're going to talk about it over the next four weeks. And of course, it's not the C4 approach or getting people to see things your way. Our actual series title for this series is Reassembly Required, A Beginner's Guide to Repairing Broken Relationships. It's just a beginner's guide, but we have to learn how to repair relationships. And so what we're going to do over the next four weeks is we're going to look at four decisions that we make, that we can make to pave the way to a restored relationship. Four decisions. But before we look at any of those decisions, we're going to spend our time today just looking at the problem itself. But I also want to look at why it's so important for us to talk about this. Why it's so important as a church for us to talk about this. And we're going to get to scripture, right? Just like we do every single week here at Community, we're going to look to truth. We're going to look to Jesus' teaching and other teaching out of the Bible for wisdom and for truth. But for a while... I want us to take time to look and deep dive into the problem itself and why we should care so much. And I'm telling you that, I'm telling you that because for some of you this morning, this is going to drive you absolutely nuts, right? Because it's going to take us a little bit longer to get to the Bible than what we normally do. And you're going to be sitting there thinking, come on, John, we're in church already. Where's the Bible? That's why we're here. And I get you. I, 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 feel, I feel your pain because that's actually how I'm wired too, right? I normally give a speaker about five minutes and then my timer goes off and I'm like, where's the Bible, man? Stop clamoring on. Um, but, but sometimes you need to fully explore a problem before you can apply the truth. It's kind of like it's really hard to apply the right medicine unless you properly or fully diagnose the problem in the first place. So we need to spend some time diagnosing the problem this morning. So hang with me. We're going to get to scripture, but we, we, we need to look at the problem a little further. And for others of you this morning, it's going to drive you nuts, but for a completely different reason. And that's because as we start talking about relationships, you probably already know that that's a problem for you in your life, right? You probably maybe even had a face flash in your head or a situation flash in your head. And I get it. Relationships are hard, right? And you could be here this morning and you're filled with pain and anger or bitterness. And you don't know what to do about it. And quite frankly, you don't know if you want to do anything about it. But again, that's exactly why we're going to spend four weeks covering this topic. Because relationships are hard. And for all of us, relationships are a little bit like a cell phone. A little bit like a cell phone. You know, we're really good at turning a cell phone on and starting it. We can operate a cell phone as long as it's working fine, but we drop it once and it gets broken or shattered. And suddenly, most of us have no clue what to do. We have no idea how to reassemble the relationship. And so that's why we think it's so important to spend a few weeks talking about it. So as we already talked about, when a relationship gets broken, most of us, most of us go back to the four C's, convince, convict, coerce, and control, even though these have never worked for us, even though we know 
We don't like these used on us. And the weird part about the four C's is that even when we don't intend to use them, sometimes they're embedded in things we say. We don't even mean it, but they're embedded in what we say. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example, and you see this one a lot on TV. Politicians say this one a lot, or celebrities. I see this a lot in social media discussions where two people decide to get in a real serious social media discussion, because that's a great place to have a serious conversation, right? But anyways, this is, this is a phrase that you often hear on TV. I'm sorry if I offended you, right? I'm sorry if I offended you. And we think to ourselves when we say that, can't you see I'm trying to move in your direction, right? I'm trying my best here. I'm sorry if I offended you. But do you know what the other person hears when we say that? Here's what they hear. You are too easily offended, right? That's what they hear. All right, what I said, it wouldn't have offended most people, but for some reason it offended you, so I'm sorry for that. And that's coercive, that's controlling, and we, we don't even know we've grabbed that tool already. Or here's another one. Here's another one we say a lot. I said I'm sorry. Why are you still upset? Now, I'm going to talk to the men for a second here. I can do that. I'm qualified because I was a man before I became a pastor, right? So I can, I can talk to the men here for a second. Men, I feel like we reach for this one the most, to be honest with you. I feel like guys say this all the time, right? I said, I'm sorry. Why are you still upset? And do you know what the other person hears when we say that? Here's what they hear. I've done my part. You should be fine now. And since you're not fine, clearly something's wrong with you, right? I've done my part. We should be smooth sailing now. My problem's over, but if there's still a problem, I guess it's your problem. See, fixing relationships isn't easy for us, and we reach for the wrong tools even when we don't intend to. And when we start leading down a path where things get fractured or things start to get broken, you can spot it because you say the same things, right? You hear things coming out of your mouth like, do we have to go there too? Are they going to be there? How long do we have to stay? How long are they staying? And we've all been to the wedding. We've all been to the graduation party or family picnic where two people aren't making eye contact, right? Or if it's you, maybe you're, you're talking to people and you're mingling, but it's real strategic because you don't want to seem like you're avoiding someone, but you're definitely avoiding someone. And then there's an accident or there's a funeral. And suddenly that issue, that issue that broke the relationship in the first place, it starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes a tragedy to jumpstart the healing process. But in the meantime, you've lost years of relationship. Because we're all wired very similarly. When we start a broken relationship, when things are strange, we go through this really predictable process. Here's the process we go through. We go through the waiting, the rehearsing, and the avoiding. You know, we, we wait. We wait because we're waiting for them to come say, I'm sorry. We're waiting for them to come admit that they were wrong, which is a little ironic if you think about it, because we're waiting because we think we're right, and we think we have a right to be hurt. And if we're right, we must be the better person, and usually the better person should make the first move, but Eh, not in this case. I'm just going to wait. And so then we just start rehearsing, right? You start rehearsing your guilt trip. You start pulling out those C4 methods, and you've got your story down. You're going to make them really feel it when they finally approach you. But because we're waiting, we just keep rehearsing and refining, and we dig our heels in deeper, and then we just start avoiding, right? We just start avoiding the person. We avoid the issue altogether, and here's the ironic part about avoiding. After a while, that hurt and pain that we feel because of the broken relationship, because we're avoiding, it actually starts to feel more comfortable than what we think the healing process would look like. So we don't want to heal, and we just keep avoiding, avoiding, avoiding. Which is why we're doing this series, Reassembly Required. This is just a beginner's guide to repairing broken relationships but it's so needed in our lives. And as I said, we're going to look at four decisions starting next week, four decisions that pave the way towards restoring relationships. But before we do, before we get there, I want to make sure our goal is right through the series, that we're all aiming for the same place. 
because it's really important to have the right goal. And this is going to seem a little confusing at first, but stick with me. I also want to let you know that this is between adults, right? So this is in relation to another adult relationship in your life. We're not talking about parenting young children. But when it comes to our goal, our goal isn't reconciliation. Our goal isn't reconciliation. And I know you're like, what are you talking about? But hear me out. Your goal is an agenda. And agendas actually undermine relationships. Agendas are reason that broken relationships stay broken. And I'm, I'm going to give you a little tip for life here. Here's the tip. Never, ever set a goal for another adult when it comes to your relationship with them. Don't do it. You can set a goal for yourself, but when you set a goal for someone else in a relationship, it becomes an agenda. It becomes something that, whether you know it or not, you're evaluating and judging all the time. If you, if you don't believe me, let me ask you this question. Do you enjoy it when someone has an agenda for you? Do you enjoy it when someone is evaluating and judging you constantly against that agenda? No. No, nobody enjoys that. It's stressful. That's a stressful way to be in a relationship. It's impossible to repair a relationship when there's an agenda. So while we may pray for reconciliation and work towards reconciliation, we're going to desire reconciliation, but our goal, our goal is no regrets. Our goal is knowing that we've done everything we can to pave the way towards reconciliation, right? You've, you've opened the front door, you put up the welcome mat, you put down the drawbridge so they can get across, you've removed every single obstacle to pave the way for reconciliation. Our goal isn't reconciliation, that's our desire. Our goal is no regrets because Remember, their decision to move towards reconciliation, their decision to want to be reconciled, it's just that. It's their decision, not yours. You can't control that. And so you may be thinking, hey, John, this sounds like a great topic. You know, this is a good psychology or social topic or counseling or therapy topic. Why is it so important for us to talk about it in church? Why are we taking an entire month to talk about relationships in church? And I think that answer is pretty obvious, and here's the answer. We ran out of topics to talk about. <laughs> we did. This is just what we came up with. We had nothing else. No, that's, that's, that's obviously not it. Uh, just thought in, such a, in the middle of such a heavy topic, maybe you needed a, a little bit of a laugh. But no, um, here's the reason why it's so important. Because for those of us that are here this morning that say we're a uh, Jesus believer, right? You believe in Jesus, and not only that, that you're a Jesus follower. You're following Jesus in the way you live your life. If that's you, then this word is not optional. Reconciliation is not optional for you. In fact, you could say reconciliation is the operative word of the Christian faith. When you look at God's story, it's reconciliation. When you read God's story through the pages of history in the Bible, it's about restoring relationships. And when you read God's story about him and us and sin and brokenness, here's what you realize is that God wasn't content to just forgive you. Jesus didn't die on the cross just so you could be forgiven. He wants a relationship with you, right? We know that. And so this is really important when it comes to how we live out our Christian faith and Christianity. When it comes to relationships around us, here's the lesson we get from it, that forgiveness is only half of the equation, right? When it comes to repairing relationships in our life, forgiveness is only half of the equation. Don't reduce Christianity to just forgiveness. It's an essential and important part, but it's so much more than that. But I feel like over time, the church has conveniently separated forgiveness and reconciliation. Why? Because forgiveness is the easy part. It is, because we control that, right? I can forgive you, but not move towards being reconciled with you. As we said, I don't control someone else's decision to reconcile, so it can be messy and it can be hard. And yeah, sometimes reconciliation can be unsafe and unwise, but most of the time, it's just really, really super uncomfortable. 
But don't reduce Christianity to forgiveness because it's so much more than that. It's a necessary and essential part. But thank goodness that God was not content to just forgive us. In fact, for God, forgiveness was really a means to an end. Right? For God, forgiveness removed an obstacle for us to have a restored relationship with him. Sin was the obstacle. So forgiveness removed that obstacle so we could have a relationship with him. And so that's why we're talking about it as a church. And I know it's hard, right? I know it's hard. Relationships are hard. We reach for the wrong tools. It's not intuitive. It's not natural. But that's what we're called to do. There's a verse that we point to a lot here at Community Church. In fact, you guys have probably, if, if you've been here a while, have seen it so much. A lot of you may have it memorized. But it's a, a really, really good anchor point for Christians. Really good anchor point when it comes to challenges and difficult things in life. And it's found in the book of John. It's when Jesus is talking to his disciples at the Last Supper. And here's what Jesus said. These words may be familiar to you. A new command I give you, love one another. And that's usually... That's usually what we remember. And that would have been easier, a lot easier, because we could probably justify what we're doing is love or how it's loving. But that's not completely what Jesus said. Here how, here's how he finished that verse. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And so that raises the bar for us, because Jesus didn't die on the cross just to forgive your sins. He died on the cross so you could have a restored relationship with you, and that's what he's called us to. Reconciliation is an operative word for those of us that call ourselves Christians. But I know for some of you, you're thinking right now, I don't know, John, that, that's hard, right? You, you don't know what he said to me. You don't know when, what she did to me. You don't know the way they treated me. And you know, by the way, it's all their fault. And I don't know why I have to be concerned with reconciliation. It's all their fault. This is really, really hard. And I know it is. I know it is. But as followers of Jesus, this is what we're called to. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church in Philippi, he decided to kind of expound on this command from Jesus a little further. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, here's what Paul tells us about this command. Paul starts out by saying, therefore, if you, and this is Jesus' followers, by the way, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. So Paul's saying, look, for those of you that know Jesus and you have a restored relationship with him, if that gives you any encouragement, if any comfort that you get from his love, how he loved you, if any common sharing in the spirit, because remember, the Holy Spirit, that was a helper that God gave us as a gift, if any tenderness and compassion, so this, warning you, this is a setup from Paul. He's saying, if you believe and follow Jesus, and you know that Jesus not only forgave you, but restored a relationship with you and loves you this much, Paul goes on and he says, because of all that, then, this is key, then, as a result of, right, as a result of Jesus loving you so much and wanting a restored relationship with you, make my joy complete by being like-minded, thinking just like Jesus does, having the same kind of love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Paul goes on. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Next verse. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, when it comes to reconciliation, our part in it, humility is a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? Humility is one of the hardest things because humility requires us to set aside our own interests, to set aside what we think is best for us and actually prioritize the needs of someone else, their interests above our own, which, by the way, that's the definition of love. But that doesn't come naturally. In fact, not only does it not come naturally, it feels like we actually resist that. It's for certain not what the world tells us and our culture tells us how we should respond. Paul goes on and he says, look, in your relationships, and so that's what we're talking about, and keep in mind, Paul doesn't say in all your healthy relationships. This is 
all relationships, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And just in case, just in case we were tempted to fill in our blank of what that mindset means, Paul says, hey, let me, let me be crystal clear on what that mindset of Jesus is like. Here's what he says. Who, when he's talking about Jesus, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Verse 7. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. In verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. There's that humility. By becoming obedient to death. And then Paul kind of makes an exclamation point. Even death on a cross. I want you to hear this. If if you tuned out, just tune back in for this, just for a second, because this is so important. When it comes to your relationship with God, right, each of our own personal relationship with God, our relationship with Jesus, he completely has the upper hand, right? He completely has the right to be in the power position. Why? Well, one, he's God. Two, when it comes to what broke the relationship in the first place, it's sin, and that's all us, not him at all. And so when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, he could have demanded everything. He could have asked for anything from us because we're at fault. But he didn't. Here's what he did. He humbled himself. He offered himself as a sacrifice, and it wasn't just death. It was death on a cross. The way it went down with the arrest and the beatings and the mocking and the crucifixion, that was just the most humiliating way you could go through it. But Jesus wasn't content with just forgiving us. If he was, by the way, Judaism that existed during the time of Jesus and before, it kind of had a mechanism to cover that, right? In early Judaism, you could go to the temple and you could offer sacrifices for your sins, and then you went back to life and you tried to obey the 600 plus laws that would keep you away from sin, but you didn't do that, so you went back to the temple and you sacrificed, you tried to keep the laws, you broke them, you sacrificed, and it was a wash, rinse, and repeat cycle. And Jesus could have kept that going, by the way. But how does that go for your relationships, right? Because we've all had relationships like that. Hopefully nobody's sacrificing animals for relationships, but... We go to someone and we ask for forgiveness and then we try to avoid the thing that got us in hot water to begin with or strain the relationship and then we go back and ask for forgiveness and then we try to avoid and we do it and we go back. It's a wash, rinse, and repeat cycle too and that never works well. That does not bring about a healthy relationship. See, Jesus loves us so much that he wasn't content just to give us forgiveness. He wanted a restored relationship with us. God's desire all along, his win, if you will, is a reconciled relationship with each of us. I love how in the book of Matthew, it's illustrated so well in the parable of the 99 sheep. Some of you may be familiar with that, but Jesus tells this parable of a shepherd who's watching 100 sheep and one wanders away, right? And let's be clear, it was the sheep's fault. Shepherd did nothing, completely the sheep's fault. But Jesus went, and he says the shepherd went after the sheep, right? Just like the song Reckless Love, he pursued the sheep. And not only was he looking for a restored relationship, he celebrated when he was reconciled. I'm so glad that God wasn't content to deal with us from an arm's length, right? To say, hey, you stupid sheep, right? It's your fault. You can go on your way, and I'll just be right here. You come to me when you're ready, right? You know what you've done. When you, when you realize what's better for you, then maybe I'll reconcile. That's not what the parable tells us. It says that he pursued us, that God made the first move, that he wanted a restored and reconciled relationship with us, and he had to remove the obstacle of sin to get there. And so as we look at Reassembling relationships, it's going to require effort. Reassembling relationships requires us to make the first move. 
It requires us to remove every single obstacle that stands in the way of reconciliation between us and them. But that's how God treated us, right? That's how Jesus loved us. And he said we need to love one another like he loved us. Paul says we need to have that same mindset. And that's why reconciliation is so important for us to talk about. So over the next four weeks, as I said, and next week we're going to look at the very first decision out of four decisions we can make to pave the way to reconciliation. But between then and now, as we close today, I want to give you a question to wrestle with. I want to give you a question to wrestle with over this next week, and it's not going to be the obvious question, right? It's not going to be who do you have a broken relationship with or why do you have broken relationships? You know that. My guess is those people, those situations, those events, those have gone through your head this entire message. So you know those. Here's the question I want you to wrestle with. As it comes to reconciliation in your life, what's stopping me from trying? When it comes to reconciliation, what's stopping you from trying? And here's, here's what I want you to do, ready? I want you to take whatever comes out first, your first response, I want you to take that and set it aside. Move it aside for a minute, and then I want you to re-ask yourself, what's stopping me from trying really? What's really stopping me? Not my typical excuse, not my normal, here's my line of defense. What's really stopping me from trying? And that's where we're going to pick it up next week. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I come to you this morning, and it's just such a heavy topic because, man, human relationships are tough. We all have had pain and anger and hurt. And so this is a subject that just touches on all of us, and sometimes that, that wound goes really, really deep. And so this is, this is a tough subject to cover, but I am so thankful that you were not content just to forgive us, right? That's a, a big part of it, but you not only wanted to be reconciled with us, you moved in our direction. You made the effort. You made the first move. And so for those of us that call ourselves Jesus followers, that's, that's got to be our mindset. And so as we talk about this over the next four weeks, as we wrestle with what's really stopping us from trying, I ask that your spirit work within us, that you not just convict us, but also encourage us and give us strength. And through this series, may we find reconciliation. In your name we pray. Amen.